morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us today as we present our findings and recommendations from our global policy project in Nepal, for which we work with a local NGO creating possibilities. Our team comprises of Shah, Daniela, Bushar, Hadis, and myself, Martin. Before we continue further, we'd like to make you guys watch a nice video we've prepared for the conference. <laughs> This is Maya's story. Maya remembers missing many school days because of unimaginable pain. Now, at age 25, she is unable to work in the field because of chronic pain. Her husband is upset with her since she is sometimes too tired to cook or take care of the family. Maya's husband went to the nearby health post one day where the doctor misdiagnosed her for having a kidney infection and sent her home with pain medication. Maya's pain would subside temporarily, but would come back interfering with her day-to-day -day tasks. Maya was later diagnosed with an inherited blood disease known as sickle cell disease. This is a genetic disease. You will need to get a diagnostic test that we can't offer at this health post. The government offers one life in peace if you are diagnosed with the disease for the treatment and the management of it. This is not a curable disease, and you will have to live with this for the rest of your life. Sickle cell disease is a genetic blood disorder characterized by the presence of sickle or crescent-shaped red blood cells. With this condition, there aren't enough healthy red blood cells to carry adequate oxygen throughout the body. This causes anemia, fatigue, chronic pain, and gives rise to other serious medical complications. Maya feels distraught. She doesn't know how she will manage this lifelong disease with limited accessibility to health services while living in her rural community. Just to elaborate further, our field research focused on the Dang district, which is located in province number five. And yes, it is actually called province number five. <laughs> the Dang district has a population of just over half a million, and it is home to a large group of indigenous population known as the Pali. This community is at a high risk of having sickle cell disease. Preliminary estimates of sickle cell trait prevalence amongst the Tharu in the region was found to be approximately 10% as conducted through a mass screening program <coughs> by UBC medical students. So the problem that we've been working with is that the Nepali government's current public health policy infrastructure and services are inadequate in addressing the socioeconomic impacts of sickle cell disease and supporting appropriate disease management needs of the rural communities in the Ang district. We will continue to refer to sickle cell disease as SC. So our research teams focused on policy and socioeconomic barriers, challenges for patients and medical staff, and lastly, gaps in the current policy, which is titled as the Disadvantaged Citizens Medicine and Treatment Fund. As for our methodology, we focused on secondary research, interviews, focus groups, and non-participant observations that added value to our overall experience in Nepal. Before we proceed further, we would like to address some key limitations and assumptions we had as we worked on this project. Firstly, Nepal has recently become a federal democratic republic and is therefore adapting to its new form of governance. Secondly, we had a time constraint. We were only on the field for two weeks. Furthermore, SCD has recently become a public health issue as it was not a priority before having to compete with the prominence of other communicable diseases. Therefore, the current supports and policies in place for SCD are still in the early stages. Our main assumption is using Dang District as a test case to learn about key challenges for SCD to inform more provincially applicable recommendations. Now, I will hand it over to my colleagues to present to you the key findings and recommendations. Hello, everyone. So, our first key finding pertains to government. Hello. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> Thank you. So our first key finding pertains to government. 
uh, staff at hospitals and local health posts that we visited both brought up the fact that they were con that they did not know under what government authority their health center fell under, which had implications for their daily operations. For example, managers at the Gangapur Health Post, which is located in rural Nepal, stated they had limited supplies for SED screening and limited supplies, uh, limited educational materials on SED for the public. And however, they did not know who to contact in government in order to get more of these supplies or further training supports on SCD. The fragmented chains of command issue was also brought up by the social minister of the Minister of Social Development of Province Number no. Five. He stated that government offices were currently in disarray, including those in the health sector. He said offices didn't have a shared knowledge or understanding of their jurisdiction or responsibilities. So the fragmented chains of command posed three obstacles for SCD-related services. First, they disrupt collaboration among government levels. Second, it hampers the communication across medical facilities, even those within the same province. And third, it impedes the implementation of national level policy like the Disadvantaged Citizens Medicine and Treatment Fund, which is the main policy providing supports for people living with SCD. So under the Citizens Fund, patients can register with diagnostic evidence and then receive in-kind medical services at nine approved medical facilities nationally, five of which are located in province number five. Uh, so now, based on this key finding, my colleague Bashar will present our proposed recommendation. So our first step uh, in our recommendations is for province number five to officially declare sickle cell disease and inherited blood disorders as a public health priority. The second step would be to establish a provincial action group dedicated to working on sickle cell disease. The group would have med medical experts dedicated um, in SCD and other inherited blood disorders and include other public health professionals. The action group would also have a specific budget allocated to them to establish services down to the local level, including education workshops for medical staff, community awareness campaigns, <coughs> uh, procurement of diagnostic equipment, and purchasing of SCD medicine like hydroxuria. Having an overseeing group that communicates and collaborates with medical staff in rural communities strengthens communication across medical centers and facilitates operations. <clears throat> the action group would also advocate for a national health screening initiative, collaborating with health centers at all levels for inference screening and for reporting local patient numbers and supplies needed within different local communities. Infant screening is key to identifying SCD patient numbers and starting early disease management leading to healthier livelihoods and adult lives. Money invested today is money saved for tomorrow. In terms of medical capacity, our field group analysis has shown us that there is an overall shortage of staff. One doctor said that they needed at least six more doctors within their department and at least a dozen extra nurses. This shortage was evident at all local levels and health posts and hospitals in the city. On top of this, we noticed gaps in knowledge amongst SCD staff, medical staff, and volunteers at the health posts. Female community health volunteers, also <coughs> known as FCHVs, work at the local community health posts, and they also had a different idea of what the disease entailed. FCHVs are key liaisons between the health posts and the rural communities, as they're usually the first point of contact between the patient, and they're able to provide door-to-door -door service. However, they remain volunteers and do not receive any financial supports, even though they may be uh, commu vulnerable community members themselves at facing many economic difficulties. Therefore, we recommend the following strategies. So our recommendation is to have greater resources to support female community health volunteers by giving them stipends, which will encourage them and others to volunteer and increase participation. This would result in two things. First, female community health volunteers would feel encouraged to spread knowledge. Second, 
communities would benefit from adequate and accurate knowledge about SCD. Also, SCD training can be standardized throughout the country similar to first aid training. This material can be put together by SCD specialist centers and delivered by local community health post managers. I'm now turning it over to look at the patient livelihood aspect. The literature review and field research we conducted confirmed our findings that the SCD patients incurred high financial costs um, associated with having this disease. And so our team observed long, the firsthand the negative effects that these challenges had on the livelihood of patients. And as well as the financial costs associated with accessing diagnostic services and long-term care for managing the disease. The field, is, the field research allowed us to experience the commute that a typical patient would have to endure, approximately a three hour journey by bus to the nearest um, hospital in Nepal Ganj. And we were lucky enough to have a private bus, but it was a strenuous journey um, for the patient. And so a patient typically living in a rural area that needed screening would have to take time off work. They would have to take their child out of school and pay to take public transportation to a zonal hospital in order to receive the service. Um, it's a difficult journey given the poor, um, given the poor road infra infrastructure in rural parts of Nepal. And so the duration of such a trip would take at least a couple of hours, as was mentioned previously. Then upon arrival at the hospital, if the patient was lucky enough, they would be seen by a doctor, which was not always the case given the high demand um, by patients and the inadequate supply of doctors. In Nepal. And through our observations, it was quite evident <coughs> that the zonal hospital was very busy and that sometimes patients and their families would have to stay overnight just to be seen by a doctor. Consequently, patients would have to pay for initial, initial screening costs. And if diagnosed with SCD, they would have to incur the lifelong um, financial cost and the burden this would place on their lives. The patient would have constant back and forth visits to the hospital in order to get medical attention for SCD. And what makes it more complicated is that each patient's um, complications are individualized. So each person has their own set of symptoms. And this makes it that much more complex, as it's very unique for each individual person. And so Bashar will now um, outline the proposed recommendation. So in this case, we recommend schemes that give people living with the SCD options for employment. So based on our meeting with the Social Development Minister of Province Number 5, we agreed with the minister in establishing and supporting vocational training for registrants of the Disadvantaged Citizens Fund. With this in mind, individuals with SCD can be trained in jobs that are not labor intensive and ensure their access to a livelihood. We also recommend concentrating on initiatives that bring services closer to the patient. For instance, reimbursement schemes for transportation or diagnostic testing costs can be provided for SCD positive patients. Another option is having blood transported to the nearest diagnostic center. Vehicles can transport blood samples from local community health posts to hospitals with equipment, diagnostic equipment, and send the test results back to the local health posts. This would not only decrease the need for travel, but at the same time reduce over demand at medical centers. We would like to acknowledge that policy challenges need to be addressed both on operational and structural levels. During this presentation, we have focused on the operational recommendations that are further developed in our report. They are also accompanied by some suggestions on structural changes. We recognize that large scale changes need to be implemented and they take time for that and require sufficient resources and persistent effort with the involvement of all major stakeholders. Nepal's transition into a federal system of governance provides an unprecedented opportunity for province number five to capitalize on government decentralization to customize policy in order to address uh, province-specific public health needs. In the case of SCD and other inherited blood disorders, this is the Disadvantaged Citizens Medicine and Treatment Fund is the perfect platform upon to which build further capacity and integrate within the public health service. With our report, we hope to empower creating possibilities with advocacy tools to help reform and improve public health services 
and fill in informational gaps. To conclude, I'd like to echo what my colleague Rashar <coughs> mentioned earlier. Money invested today, it will be money saved tomorrow. Thank you for listening and thank you.
to just get the testing, then they would need to go to their municipality office, get a letter, and then go back to the hospital. So just to even get access to it and be recognized within this fund was like a tedious process. Um, you expect the uh, plan, creating possibilities, to be the vehicle for advocacy. Um, now, policy advocacy requires certain skills. Do they have that? And if, uh, if CP has it, or does the NGO sector in Nepal play that role? Is there any history of them doing that? Well, yeah. uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so creating possibilities is actually a lovely organization full of very, very involved people. Like we said, we have they have very strong connections with uh, government officials at, and medical uh, facilities within province number five, which is where they also have a, a, region, a regional office. So it's not just Dinesh, who we all love. Uh, he is the head director of ZP, and he works tirelessly contacting people constantly. So yes, they do have capacity, of course, long-term future, they do need to maybe think about not everything falling on certain individuals. They would have to build capacity within their own organization in order to keep liaising with government. But that's where, for example, our recommendation of having an action group would help them because they can be involved in that action group for further advocacy. And they also have very constructive relationships with other NGOs that we also visited in, that work with rural communities in Nepal. So it's like a whole network of them. Um, I was struck by this action group recommendation. Um, it's often been used as sort of a mission style uh, effort to address uh, issues, particularly where governance is confused uh, or uh, messy. Um, do you have any sense at all of whether this mission style of operation has been adopted in province five? And if so, what success, if any, they've had with it? Yes, so the, this recommendation is actually based on things that they're already doing in terms of uh, vaccination. Nepal has a great vaccination program and coverage throughout Nepal for communicable diseases and basic infant vaccinations like polio. So what they do is that they have a group that oversees, has a budget on its own. So it has a budget to purchase not only the vaccine, but any, like the injection, uh, syringes, thank you. And, uh, um, and they coordinate vertically. Uh, this is a national group. We decided to make it more of a provincial one for SCD just because the burden of the disease is larger in SCD, but it is inspired by current capacity in Nepal that has been proven to be successful.
So, for in terms of money, uh, citizen the disadvantaged citizens fund does provide a hundred thousand rupees per person. So they do have money stored away. It's just because of the barriers in accessing it, it's not fully it's not fully being used. So we're talking about using some of those funds that are have been made available in order to instate some of these recommendations. Uh, we do make some calculations in our report, but I'm blanking on the, on the numbers. numbers. I apologize. Yes. But this is a, an expense that the social health minister has also calculated at 80 million rupees. Um, but yeah, their focus was we have the money, just tell us where it should go. And just to add to that, um, with regards to our stakeholder meeting, we also saw that. Even at the local level, at the municipal level, there there is willingness to increase um, funding for helping patients go um, to the hospital to get diagnostic tests tests done. So just to add to that, it's not just that the funding is there; they need to know where to allocate it, but also filling the informational gap because there's still a lot of confusion, and even hey, people who possibly have the disease don't know that there's this fund available for them to tap into that the government has provided. Um, as you mentioned, there's a large concentration of a particular population in this particular part of Nepal, but we also know that people migrate and move um, into lots of other places, and I'm wondering whether you were able to look at um, this particular population, the Taros in, say, Kathmandu or more urban places, and what kind of treatment they would be getting, or more particularly people with it, uh, sickle cell disease in other parts, and whether these kinds of schemes and things that you're describing would be applicable to people who don't live in this particular area? Well, we did um, use Tara as a test case. We kind of um, standardized it to anyone, who, because um, it's not just a thyroid problem, as it's right. been told. Um, it's a genetic disease. Anyone could have it. Um, however, it, it is more prominent within um, the thyroid community, and they migrate a lot. So um, just to so add to basically. <laughs> so, like, we all have answers. <laughs> so basically, yes, we are. Our focus was rural Nepal because that was something experts kept saying: is <coughs> hospitals in the city, in a big city like Kathmandu, are able to come meet the man and help people and register them under the fund. The true challenges are in the ruralities, and yes, we acknowledge that there's a large migrant population, <coughs> but. Uh, we have systems in place or recommendations that in our report that would allow them to access services no matter where they are uh, through an identification card that they can take to facilities, different facilities across Nepal, not just depending on one facility like it is now. So we do try to make provisions for the fact that people move around. Um, but yeah, our focus was in bringing services closer to rural communities. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> okay, sorry. Um, so you mentioned a limitation of healthcare staff as, and, and doctors specifically is what I'm asking about, as one of the, the key um, challenges in, in properly treating, assessing, diagnosing mm -hmm. sickle cell. Um, so in terms of the, the centers you looked at and the way that healthcare is delivered uh, in your area, what were the limitations, what were the main challenges in uh, and retaining those healthcare staff? Was it recruitment? Was it retention? Was it uh, other, other things? Was there a lack of qualified staff? Or what, what was the, did you identify any approaches to maybe alleviating that shortage? We, we saw a little bit of everything, but we also did see that um, there weren't equi equipment as well was an issue. There was only one equipment and not everybody could work on it all together. So while there was also shortage of staff, there was also a shortage of equipment to work with. And uh, uh, we think that that could be one of the challenges. But again, other factors, like you said, so recruitment issues, not having enough doctors, just like any other. Um, yeah. And there's issues. issues around training as well. SCD has only made it into the national, into like medical school uh, curriculums, um, like just, just last year. Yeah. 
So they're beginning to try to build more capacity in terms of their medical health service. But one thing that we also mentioned in our report is you don't need millions and millions of doctors to fix this issue. You can do a small, you can work with some of the capacity that you have right now, of course, with prospects to build it up. But for example, the community health workers are a huge, huge untapped um, resource. Yes. If you educate them better, and you have consistent training, in, especially in rural areas working with this volunteer group, it'll solve a lot of, not solve, it'll mitigate a lot of the public awareness, stigma, and it'll encourage people to come to the health center to get screened. It's beginning making those small changes on the ground and eventually building up to greater structural things that Nepal does have a history of struggling with medical capacity in terms of equipment and in terms of talent, uh, which are more long, uh, which need to be addressed in a more long term. Just concluding yeah. on that point, sir. Yeah. Um, Shah also mentioned that um, the community health workers and other staff are not really properly compensated, and that's a huge issue that we notice. And so the recommendation we propose in terms of incentivizing and encouraging them via stipend or other um, motivational tools would be a really good way in encouraging people to come into that training and to come into that field to possibly to extend. And of your own way of building talent within these communities themselves. Thank you. Thank you.